Welcome to my reading of the sixth night, which is the seventh chapter in our Ravinda Diga's The White Tiger. If you're listening to this, it's highly likely that you've listened to my other videos as well. And I just wanted to say thanks for that. I know they are long and uh, it's, uh, it's a long time to be listening to one voice. But if you're still here, you're obviously getting something out of it. And I really appreciate that. It makes my work worthwhile to know that people are finding it worthwhile. Please like and subscribe to my channel so that I can collect subscribers. I promise I won't spam you and I don't make that many videos that they're going to get annoying. I appreciate the having the subscribers very much. So please do that for me. Okay, so to get on with the sixth night, a couple of things about this chapter. The first is it's quite a long chapter and that although that can be a little bit daunting, you can know that by the time you got through it, you're up to the 90% mark in the text and that the last chapter is actually quite short. It's a really meaty chapter where Balram takes us through the reasoning behind his final decision to kill Ashok. There's a lot of toing and froing as he um, works through his his process of coming to terms with what he's going to do, his indecision, uh, the pros and the cons of it, and eventually making his choice. He, he does a lot in this chapter, and I'll just, just run you through some of the things that happen here. There is a, um, you know, at the beginning of the chapter, he get he has that section, he has a section where he's um, fairly lightheartedly discussing, you know, the, how the Indian middle class are becoming fat and uh, trying to exercise weight off their body. Um, it also has the sidebar where Balram is discussing his um, the how drivers and servants can become entrepreneurial and corrupt, taking advantage of their situation. Uh, he goes to visit uh, Anastasia, the uh, golden-haired sex worker, and there's that whole scene involving that. Um, he then uh, finds Ashok back in his room, uh, back at the Buckingham Towers number B, and Balram and Ashok go out and share a meal together. Um, after that, Mukesh arrives, and we see the red bag for the first time, and there's a, a sequence on the bribery um, that the family are involved in. Balram gives money to a beggar in this chapter, um, ar arousing Mukesh's suspicion. There's a discussion of the city, and Balram's beginning to feel that he wants to um, to do something that he shouldn't do, and um, he goes starts putting in place some of his plans. He goes to the railway station to look at his point of departure. He revisits the red light district of Delhi, and uh, you know, in uh, counterpose to the earlier visit where he meets the golden-haired sex worker Anastasia. This time he gets it, and that this uh, this isn't a way out for him. He visits the book market in uh, in Delhi and has a conversation about poetry there, which is fairly important. He visits the meat market and sees the buff the buffalo there and has a has a moment where he he um, thinks about his own family and and how his actions if he was to steal from Ashok would lead to this slaughter. He uh, he has another encounter with, with Ashok who offers him money. Uh, a very small amount of money, which is so trivial, it's ridiculous. He then ventures back out again and uh, visits a slum and uh, draws some conclusions about life from, from that. He finishes all of that up by getting a wrench and beginning to think, yes, I'm going to kill Ashok. And then his nephew is back in the apartment. Dharam is there with a letter from Granny Kusum and uh, he's presented with uh, a reason not to kill Ashok. But then he finds out that Ashok is thinking of replacing him as a driver and that his time, as a, even with this lowly job, is running out and he's going to end up uh, in a much worse situation than he's already in. And he, the thoughts return about, about killing Ashok. He also, in this chapter, visits the zoo, sees the white tiger, and um, he, uh, he eventually... Uh, he eventually goes and um, and uh, kills Ashok and um, is about to make his getaway when he decides that he needs to go back for his nephew and does that. So there's a lot in this chapter and I'm going to read and kind of explain. There's also a lot of symbolism in the writing. It's really cleverly written. 
I've enjoyed going back over it preparing for this and just seeing how, how well written this is and how well the novel stands up. It's now 10 years old, still being studied all around the world and, and I think it'll be around for a while longer. I think it's still a highly relevant novel to the world that we live in. So I hope you enjoy it. The first thing I want to do is just remind you of what, what happens in the previous chapter and, and this discussion at the end where he's there are some highly revolutionary thoughts going through his mind and he's saying things like, it's as if the city is speaking to him and he says, speak to me of civil war and speak to me of blood on the streets. And it's really, um, Adiga has ramped up the feeling in this chapter too, in, in this final chapter. And, uh, and, 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 and it's about the rich and the poor. If there is blood on these streets, do you promise that he'll be the first to go, meaning the fat man, the man that's the, the bribery, that involved in all of the bribery? So it's really ramping up this idea that Balram, in his own head at least, is a revolutionary character who wants really fu fundamental change. And it finishes with the finding of the golden hair um, in, in the car. And uh, so then we shift into the sixth night. So the sixth night, the dreams of the rich and the dreams of the poor, they never overlap, do they? And you'll see as I go, I've highlighted good quotes um, for you. And the next one's been highlighted by 172 people, but not me, interestingly, um, because to me, this chapter shifts into a, a fairly superficial example which is about um, food and eating. See, the poor dream all of their lives of getting enough to eat and looking like the rich. And what do the rich dream of? Losing weight and looking like the poor. So, I mean, you could you could include this as an example. I mean, there's, it's an example of irony, I suppose. Um, and also the topsy-turvy kind of nature of India that Adiga likes to show the kind of craziness of the situation. Every evening, the compound around Buckingham Tower's B block becomes an exercise ground. Plump, paunchy men and even plumper, paunchy women with big circles of sweat below their arms are doing their evening walking. See, with all these late night parties, all that drinking and munching, the rich tend to get fat in Delhi, so they walk to lose weight. And where should a human being walk? In the outdoors, by a river, inside a park, around a forest. However, displaying their usual genius for town planning, all right, I'm just going to highlight that too, because it's another example of the sort of use of sarcasm uh, to d describe how hopeless India is. The rich of Delhi had built this part of Gurgaon with no parks, lawns or playgrounds. It was just buildings, shopping malls, hotels and more buildings. There was a pavement outside, but that was for the poor to live on. So if you wanted to do some walking, it had to be done around the concrete compound of your own building. So here Adiga is really wanting just to keep having those digs at how unplanned and disorganised India is and how it doesn't really work to anyone's advantage. Now, while they walked around the apartment block, the fatsos made their thin servants, most of them drivers, stand at various spots on that circle with bottles of mineral water and fresh towels in their hands. Each time they completed a circle, a circuit around the building, they stopped next to their man, grabbed the bottle, gulp, grabbed the towel, wipe, wipe, and then it was off on round two. Vitiligo Lips was standing in one corner of the compound with his bottle and his master's sweaty towel. Every few minutes he turned to me with a twinkle in his eyes. His boss, the steel man, who was bald until two, until two weeks ago, now sported a head of thick black hair, an expensive toupee job he'd gone all the way to England for. This toupee was the main subject of discussion in the monkey circle these days. The other drivers had offered Vitiligo Lips 10 rupees to resort to the old tricks of braking unexpectedly or taking the car full speed over a pothole to knock off his master's toupee at least once. And I've highlighted the monkey circle there because that those kinds of um, uh, that that kind of uh, um, metaphor, it's a metaphor, is meant to sort of draw out the idea that these these men lack all power in their lives. That they're they're kind of monkey like in that they are not able to be fully men in a, in a way. And uh, also monkeys tend to chatter. They sit and chatter with each other. So it's, it's bringing out that idea. This also reminded me of uh, being in primary school when my headmaster 
had a toupee, and I remember him playing a game of could have been netball actually, and his toupee flying up and down in the air as he ran. And I can still see that image in my head, even though it is now um, probably more than 40 years ago. All right, so the secrets of their masters were spilled and dissected every evening by the monkey circle. Though if any of them made the made divorce a topic of discussion, he knew he would have to deal with me. On Ashok's privacy, I allowed no one to infringe. And you'll just see as I go, there are a number of examples in this early part of the chapter where Adiga goes out of the way to, or Balram, the narrator, goes out of his way to show that, that, that his loyalty to Ashok is still there, even though they've been through the framing incident and, and so forth. He's still loyal. I was standing just a few feet from Vitiligo Lips with my master's bottle of mineral water in my hand and his sweat-stained towel on my shoulder. Mr. Ashok was about to complete his circle. I could smell his sweat coming towards me. This was round number three for him. He took the bottle, drained it, wiped his face with his towel and draped it back on my shoulder. I'm done, Balram. Bring the towel and bottle up, okay? Yes, sir, I said and watched him go into the apartment block. He took a walk once or twice a week, but it clearly wasn't enough to counter his nights of debauchery. I saw a big wet paunch pressing against his white t-shirt. How repulsive he was these days. I signalled to Vitiligo Lips before going down to the car park. Ten minutes later, I smelled the man's sweat and heard footsteps. Vitiligo Lips had come down. I called him over to the Honda City. It was the only place in the world I felt truly safe anymore. I'm not sure why I've highlighted that. I, just, I think maybe because I thought it was a bit weird, actually. I didn't really get it. What is it, Country Mouse? Want another magazine? Not that. Something else. I got down on my haunches. I squatted by one of the tyres of the city. I scraped the grooves of the tyre with a fingernail. He squatted too. And I like the way this... We've got early on in this chapter, we've got him squatting by one of the tyres of the Honda City... And he's about to arrange a visit to a sex worker, spending all his money on, on, on that, which is a s stupid thing to waste your money on in a way, but it's his way of trying to better himself and make himself feel better about who he is and so forth. At the end of the chapter, towards the end of the chapter, he's again found squatting by the tyre, but this time he's doing something decisive, killing our shock. And it's just interesting the way the chapter has this, this moment with the tie here and towards the end, the moment again, it has the visit to the sex worker early in the chapter and later on, uh, Balram visits uh, the red light district and has quite different thoughts. So this is a chapter that's very much about the way that he changes uh, over a, a period of time. I showed him the strand of golden hair. I kept it tied around my wrist like a locket. He brought my wrist up to his nose he rubbed the strand between his fingers, sniffed it, and let my wrist down. No problem, he winked. I told you your master would get lonely. Don't talk about him. It's another example of him um, showing loyalty to Ashok. I seized his neck. He shook me off. Are you crazy? You tried to choke me. I scraped the grooves of the tyre again. How much will it cost? High class or low class? Virgin or non-virgin? All depends. I don't care. She just has to have golden hair, like in the shampoo advertisements. Cheapest is ten, twelve thousand. That's too much. He won't pay more than four thousand seven hundred. Six thousand five hundred, country mouse. That's the minimum. White skin has to be respected. All right. When does he want it, country mouse? I'll tell you. It'll be soon. And another thing. I want to know another thing. I put my face on the tyre and breathed in the smell of the rubber, the strength. How many ways are there for a driver to cheat his master? So here we have just the beginnings of Balram starting to uh, to take, you know, uh, cheating on uh, cheating our shop. And I've just highlighted white skin has to be respected just because it's uh, a good quote to kind of show uh, that aspect of, of, of the text and the racism and all of that sort of stuff. Mr. Jabal, I am aware that it is a common feature in those cellophane-wrapped business books to feature small sidebars. At this stage of the story, to relieve you of tedium, I would like to insert my own sidebar into the narrative of the modern entrepreneur's growth and development. And I love the way Adiga's done this because actually he's 
he's manipulating us, the reader, uh, by and and kind of ramping up tension and uh, relieving that tension for a moment, making us wait, which creates suspense and so forth, um, which can be hard to maintain if we know that Ash, we know that Valram's going to kill Ashok, but how are we going to make it interesting? How are we going to how is Adiga going to string us along and make it feel a little bit suspenseful? And one of the ways he does it is by stopping the narrative to give us, um, you know, other bits of information that are that are interesting. And here it's a little bit comical in the way that the discussion of the fat landlord, uh, the fat, um, the fat bosses walking around the compound was was a little bit comical as well. So here's the sidebar: How does the enterprising driver earn a little cash? When his master is not around, he can s siphon petrol from the car with a funnel, then sell the petrol. When his master orders him to make a repair to the car, he can go to a corrupt mechanic. The mechanic will inflate the price of the repair and the driver will receive a cut. This is a list of a few entrepreneurial mechanics who help, entre who help entrepreneurial drivers. Lucky mechanics in Lado Sarai near Quittam, RV repairs in Greater Kailash Part 2, Nilo Far Mechanics in DLF Phase 1 in Gurugayon. He should study his master's habits, and I should, oh, I should get that one as well. Study his master's habits, um, and then ask himself, is my master careless? If so, what are the ways in which I can benefit from his carelessness? For instance, if his master leaves empty English liquor bottles lying around in the car, he can sell the whiskey bottles to the bootleggers. Johnny Walker Black brings the best resale value, something that will become important in a few minutes. As he gains in experience and confidence and is ready to try something riskier, he can turn his master's car into a freelance taxi. The stretch of the road from Gurugayon to Delhi is excellent for this. Lots of Romeos come to see their girlfriends who work in the call centres. Once the entrepreneurial driver is sure that his master is not going to notice the absence of the car and that none of his master's friends are likely to be on the road at this time, he can spend his free time cruising around, picking up and dropping off paying customers. So all of this detail, the reason I've got bits highlighted is for my students, I've said to them, if you're going to be discussing Balram's sort of growing corruption and, and willingness to, to cheat Ashok, here are some examples that you could be using and some quotes that you could be using. That's the only reason I've got them highlighted. The Johnny Walker bottle is, is, is significant because later on, Balram does, and we'll see that in just a few minutes, he does get hold of a bottle of Johnny Walker Black lying around in the car. And he goes to go, oh, yeah, I'll go and sell this, and then changes his mind and he uses it as a weapon to kill Ashok. So that's all about that idea of him no longer going along with petty corruption to make his life just that little bit better, but taking decisive action to really fundamentally change his situation. At night I lay in my mosquito net, the light bulb on in my room, and watch the dark roaches crawling on top of the net, their antenna quivering and trembling like bits of my own nerves, and I lay in bed too agitated even to reach out and crush them. A cockroach flew down and landed right above my head. You should have asked them for money when they made you sign that thing, enough money to sleep with twenty white-skinned girls. It flew away, another landed on the same spot. Twenty, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, a thousand, ten thousand golden-haired whores, and even that would still not have been enough. So he's still stewing over this. What's even though he's got this loyalty to Ashok, he's still stewing about what's been done to him. That would not start to be enough. Over the next two weeks, I did things I am still ashamed to admit. I cheated my employer. I siphoned his petrol. I took his car to a corrupt mechanic who built in for work that was not necessary, and three times while driving back to Buckingham B, I picked up a paying customer. And you could highlight any of those as, as examples. The strangest thing was that each time I looked at the cash I had made by cheating him, instead of guilt, what did I feel? Rage. The more I stole from him, the more I realised how much he had stolen from me. So this little bits, the minute he starts to break with his loyalty to Ashok by cheating him, 
some of that whole facade begins to crack open and he begins to really confront how angry he is about what's been done to him. To go back to the analogy I used when describing Indian politics to you earlier, I was rowing a belly at last. So he wants to become one of the men with the big bellies uh, who's not going to be at the bottom, which is interesting because uh, we've we've just started the chapter with that discussion of um, you know fat bosses and skinny workers. So uh, he's shifting in his position here. Then one Sunday afternoon, when Mr. Ashok had said he wouldn't need me again that day, I gulped two big glasses of whiskey for courage. Then went down, went to the servants' dormitory. Dormitory. Vitiligo Lips was sitting beneath the poster of a film actress. Each time his master hammered an act- actress. He put her poster up on the wall, playing cards with the other drivers. Well, you can say what you want, but I know that these jokers aren't going to win the re-elec- win re-election. He looked up and saw me. Well, look who's here. It's the yoga guru playing at paying us a rare visit. Welcome, honoured sir. They showed me their teeth. I showed them my teeth. And this phrase here, this is an example of, I'm not highlighting it because I can't imagine using it as a quote, That's his relationship with the other drivers. They're smiling at each other, but they are not really smiling at each other. Uh, It's all for show. They don't don't like each other very much. We were discussing the elections, Country Mouse. You know, it's not like the darkness here. The elections aren't rigged. Are you going to vote this time? I summoned him with a finger. He shook his head. Later, Country Mouse, I'm having too much fun discussing the elections. I waved the brown envelope in the air. He put his cards down at once. Brown envelope symbolises money. I insisted that we walk down to the car park. He counted the money there in the shadow of the Honda City. Good country mouse, it's all here. And where is your master? Will you drive him there? I am my own master. He didn't get it for a minute. Then his jaw dropped. He rushed forward. He hugged me. Country mouse. He hugged me again. My man! He was from the darkness too, and you feel proud when you see one of your own kind showing some ambition in life. So it's, it is interesting, isn't it? Initially, it was that golden hair that he um, he found that provoked him to go out there and you know be corrupt and make extra money so that he too can buy um, buy this this woman that uh, that he um, that he wants and. And but but in the process of that, um, it's it's like a snowball effect or dominoes falling. That once he starts to do that, that's when he starts to um, change in his feelings towards Ashok as well. Continuing on with the story, uh, he was from the darkness too, and you feel proud when you see one of your own kind showing some ambition in life. But again, this ambition is very very restricted. It's ambition to sleep with. A better class of um, sex worker rather than to really change your life. He drove me in the qualis, his master's qualis, to the hotel, explaining on the way that he ran an informal taxi service when the boss wasn't around. This hotel was in South Extension Part 2, one of the best shopping areas in Delhi. Vitiligo Lips locked his qualis, smiled reassuringly, and walked with me up to the reception desk. A man in a white shirt and black bow tie was running his finger down the entries in a long ledger, leaving his finger on the book. He looked at me as Vitiligo Lips explained things into his ear. The manager shook his head. A golden-haired woman for him? He put his hands on the counter and leaned over so he could see me from the toes up. For him? Vitiligo Lips smiled. Look here, the rich in Delhi have had all the golden-haired women they want, Who knows what they'll want next? Green-haired women from the moon? Now it's going to be the working class that lines up for the white women. This fellow is the future of your business, I tell you. Treat him well. The manager seemed uncertain for a moment. Then he slammed the ledger shut and showed me an open palm. Give me 500 rupees extra, he grinned. Working class surcharge. I don't have it. Give me 500 or forget it. I took out the last 300 rupees I had. He took the cash, straightened his tie, and then went up the stairs. Vitiligo Lips patted me on the shoulder and said, Good luck, country mouse. Do it for all of us. I highlighted that for obvious reasons. Um, 
I ran up the stairs. Room 114A. The manager was standing at the door with his ear to it. He whispered, Anastasia. He knocked, then put his ear to the door again and said, Anastasia, are you in? He pushed the door open. A chandelier, a window, a green bed, and a girl with golden hair sitting on the bed. So I've highlighted chandelier because, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, um, Balram's telling the story sitting under a chandelier, and it kind of it represents, you know, wealth, but also kind of fairly crass, um, gaudy, um, uh, you know, not very um, beautiful kind of wealth, but, uh, yeah, a bit crass and gaudy. I sighed because this one looked nothing like Kim Bassinger, not half as pretty. That was when it hit me, in a way it never had before, how the rich always get the best things in life, and all we get is their leftovers. Again, I've highlighted that for obvious reasons. The manager brought both his palms up to my face. He opened and closed them and did it again. Twenty minutes. Then he made a knocking motion with his fist, followed by a kicking motion with his shiny boot. Get it? That's what would happen to me after 20 minutes. Yes. He slammed the door. The woman with the golden hair still wasn't looking at me. I had only summoned up the courage to sit down by her side when there was a banging on the door outside. When you hear that, it's over. Get it, the manager's voice. All right. I moved closer to the woman on the bed. She neither resisted nor encouraged. I touched a curl of her hair and pulled it gently to get her to turn her face towards me. She looked tired and worn out, and there were bruises around her eyes as if someone had scratched her. She gave me a big smile. I knew it well. It was the smile a servant gives a master. So here, um, this, this woman is being portrayed by Adiga and by Balram as, as somebody we should feel sympathy for. She's um, this is not a glamorous life at, at all. She's likely the, the victim of violence. She's being overworked. She's possi quite possibly not there by choice. If she is there by choice, it would only be the choice of this or poverty. Um, she gave me a big smile. The smile, I knew it well, the smile the servant gives its master. So she's at his mercy as well now too. What's your name? She asked in Hindi. This one too. They must have a Hindi language school for girls in this country. Ukraine, I swear. Muna, she smiled. That's not a real name, it just means boy. That's right, but it's my name, I said. My family gave me no other name. She began laughing, a high-pitched, silvery laugh that made her whole golden head, head, head of hair bob up and down. My heart beat like a horse's. Her perfume went straight to my brain. You know, when I was young, I was given a name in my language that just meant girl. My family did the same thing to me. Wow, I said, curling my legs up on the bed. We talked. She told me she hated the mosquitoes in this hotel and the manager, and I nodded. We talked for a while like this, and then she said, You're not a bad-looking fellow, and you're quite sweet. And then she ran her finger through my hair. At this point, I jumped out of the bed. I said, Why are you here, sister? If you want to leave this hotel, why don't you? Don't worry about the manager. I'm here to protect you. I am your own brother, Balram Halwai. Sure, I said that in the Hindi film they'll make of my life. So the first time I read this, I thought this had really happened, that he's really kind of seen, because Adig has done this. Uh, he's created these parallel characters, a, a boy and a girl, who are both victims of their society, and raise the possibility that they could unite together and, and work together to make a better life, to look after each other. Um, but Bowram, he, who's telling the story, he's saying, no, I, I didn't do that. Um, that's a romance, a Hindi Bollywood movie, that is. That's not real. And this is what really happened. 7,000 sweet rupees for 20 minutes, time to get started. That was what I actually said. So he hasn't chosen to take on that um, sympathetic view and see a commonality between him and this woman. Uh, instead, he's going to use her, which is the, the, what the poor are depicted as doing to each other. I climbed on top of her and held her arms behind her head with one hand. Time to dip my beak in her. I let the other hand run through her golden curls. And then I shrieked, 
I could not have shrieked louder if you'd shown me a lizard. What happened, Munna? she asked. I jumped off the bed and slapped her. So I've highlighted here the violence. So he's, he's violently assaulted her here. My, these foreigners can yell when they want to. So she's screaming now. Immediately, as if the manager had been there all the time, his ear to the door grinning, the door burst open and he came in. This, I shouted at him, pulling the girl by her hair, is not real gold. The roots were black. It was all a dye job. He shrugged. What do you expect for 7000 The real thing costs 40 50 I leapt at him, caught his chin in my hand and rammed it against the door. I want my money back. The woman let out a scream from behind me. I turned around. That was the mistake I made. I should have finished the manager right there and then. Ten minutes later, with a scratched and bruised face, I came tumbling out the front door. It slammed behind me. The Tilligo lips hadn't waited. I had to take a bus back home. I was rubbing my head the whole time. 7,000 rupees. I wanted to cry. Do you know how many water buffaloes you could have bought for that much money? I could feel Granny's fingers ringing my ears. So he's wasted a huge amount of money and not even got what he wanted. Back in Buckingham Towers at last, after a one-hour traffic jam on the road, I washed the wound on my head in the common sink and then spat a dozen times. To hell with everything! I scratched my groin. I needed that. I slouched towards my room, kicked open the door and froze. Someone was inside the mosquito net. I saw a silhouette in the lotus position. Don't worry, Balram. I know what you were doing. A man's voice. Well, at least it wasn't Granny. That was my first thought. First thought. Mr. Ashok lifted up a corner of the net and looked at me, a sly grin on his face. I know exactly what you were doing. Sir, I was calling your name and you weren't responding, so I came down to see, but I know exactly what you were doing. That other driver, the man with the pink lips, he told me. My heart pounded. I looked down at the ground. He said you're at the temple offering prayers for my health. Yes, sir, I said, with sweat pouring down my face in relief. That's right, sir. Come inside the tent, he said softly. I went in and sat next to him inside the mosquito net. He was looking at the roaches walking above us. You live in such a hole, Balram. I never knew. I'm sorry. It's all right, sir. I'm used to it. I'll give you some money, Balram. You go into some better housing tomorrow, okay? He caught my hand and turned it over. Balram, what are these red marks on your palm? Have you been pinching yourself? No, sir, it's a skin disease. I've got it here too, behind my ear. See? All those pink spots. He came close, filling my nostrils with his perfume. Bending my ear with a finger, gently, he looked. My, I never noticed. I sit behind you every day and I never... A lot of people have this disease, sir. A lot of poor people. Really, I haven't noticed. Can you get it treated? No, sir. The diseases of the poor can never get treated. My father had TB and it killed him. So I've just highlighted the disease that the poor can never get treated and it's because they haven't got the money for the treatment. It's a 21st century Balram. Anything can be treated. You go to the hospital and you get it treated. Send me the bill. I'll pay for it. Thank you, sir, I said. Sir, do you want me to take you somewhere in, in the city? He opened his lips and then closed them without making any noise. He did this a couple of times and then he said, my way of living is all wrong, Balram. I know it, but I don't have the courage to change it. I just don't have the balls. Don't think so much about it, sir. And sir, let's go upstairs. I beg you, this is not a place for a man of quality like yourself. I let people exploit me, Balram. I've never done what I wanted my whole life. I... His head sagged. His whole body looked tired and worn. You should eat something, sir, I said. You look tired. He smiled, a big, trusting, baby smile. You're always thinking of me, Balram. Yes, I want to eat, but I don't want to go to another hotel, Balram. I'm sick of hotels. Take me to the kind of place you go to eat, Balram. Sir, I'm sick of the food I eat, Balram. I'm sick of the life I lead. We rich people, we've lost our way, Balram. I want to be a simple man like you, Balram. Yes, sir. And I'm just going to grab this one while I'm here. I'm sick of the life we lead. So the reason I've highlighted all of these uh, parts of the text is 
is they're all really juicy, useful um, quotes to kind of talk about Ashok and his discomfort with the lifestyle that he's leading. So that's all there for. Um, and also, you know, that he, he, the big trusting baby smile thing here, that idea that he's, he's an innocent and that he doesn't get it and he, he's therefore, you know, can be a victim. And we, the rich people, we've lost our way, Bowram. I actually think that's one of Adiga's messages in this text, that the, the rich have lost their way. Um, and they don't they don't have a way forward either the, the, it's unsustainable having so many um, poor people um, in, in one country and, and such a corrupt system it's going to collapse somehow the poor will revolt yes sir we walked outside and I led him across the road and into a tea shop order for us Balram order the commoners food I ordered okra cauliflower radish spinach and dal enough to feed a whole family or one rich man. So there's, again, just that. I just thought it was a good phrase. He ate and burped and ate some more. This food is fantastic. And just 25 rupees. You people eat so well. When he was done, I ordered him a lassi. And if you don't know, a lassi is a, a delicious um, yogurt drink. Yum, yum. And when he took the first sip, he smiled. I like eating your kind of food. I smiled and thought, I like eating your kind of food too. The divorce papers will come through soon. That's what the lawyer said. So we've got a little asterisk up here. We've shifted again. All right. Should we start looking already for another lawyer? No, for another girl. It's too early, Mukesh. It's only been three months since she left. I had driven Mr. Ashok to the train station. The mongoose had come to town again from Darnbad. Now I was driving both of them back to the apartment. All right, take your time, but you must remarry. If you stay a divorced man, people won't respect you. They won't respect us. It's the way our society works. And I've just collected those quotes for, you know, usefulness. Listen to me. Last time you didn't listen, when you married a girl from, the outside, from outside our caste, our religion, you even refused to take dowry from her parents this time, we'll pick the girl. I heard nothing. I could tell that Mr. Ashok was clenching his teeth. I can see you getting worked up, the mongoose said. We'll talk about it later. For now, take this. He handed his brother a red bag that he had brought with him from Danbad. Mr. Ashok clicked open the bag and peered inside, and at once the mongoose slammed the bag shut. Are you crazy? Don't open that here in the car. It's for, for Mukashan, the fat man, the assistant. You know him, don't you? Yes, I know him, Mr. Ashok shrugged. Didn't we always pay those bastards off? Didn't we already pay those bastards off? The minister wants more. It's election time. Every time there's, an ele there's elections, we hand out cash, usually to both sides. I've collected that for your collection of, my collection of corruption quotes. But this time the government is going to win for sure. The opposition is in total mess. So we just have to pay off the government, which is good for us. I'll come with you for the first come with you the first time, but it's a lot of money, and you may have to go a second and a third time too. And then there are a couple of bureaucrats we have to grease. Get it? Again, I've got the have to grease as just for my corruption file. It seems like this is all I get to do in Delhi: take money out of banks and bribe people. Is this what I came back to India for? And I've collected that both for, for the theme of corruption, but also for Ashok and the way he doesn't fit um, into the world that he's living in. Don't be sarcastic. And remember, ask for the bag back each time. It's a good bag, Italian made. No need to give them any additional gifts, understand? Oh, hell, not another fucking traffic jam. Balram, play Sting again. It's the best music for a traffic jam. This driver knows who Sting is? Sure, he knows it's my favourite CD. Show us the Sting CD, Balram. See, here, he knows Sting. I put the CD into the player. Ten minutes passed and the cars had not moved an inch. I replaced Sting with Enya. I replaced Enya with m and Vendors came to the car with baskets of oranges or strawberries in plastic cases or newspapers or novels in English. The beggars were on the attack too. One beggar was carrying another on his shoulders and going from car to car. The fellow on his shoulders had no legs below his knees. 
They went together from car to car, the fe fellow without the legs moaning and groaning and the other fellow tapping or scratching on the windows of the car. Without thinking much about it, I cracked open the egg. Rolling down the glass, I held out a rupee. The fellow with the deformed legs took it and saluted me. I rolled the window up and resealed the egg. Now a rupee, I looked up, is, how much is a rupee? One rupee is um, not much, virtually nothing. I think a hundred rupees is two dollars, so it's not much. So rolling down the glass, I held out a rupee. The fellow with the deformed legs took it and saluted me. I rolled the window up and resealed the egg. The talking in the back seat stopped at once. Who the hell told you to do that? Sorry, sir, I said. Why the hell did you give that beggar a rupee? What cheek! Turn the music off! They really gave it to me that evening. So these guys, they're outraged that the driver had the audacity to give to the poor uh, in front of them. Through their, Though their talk was normally in a mix of Hindi and English, the two brothers began speaking and chased Hindi entirely for my benefit. Don't we give money each time we go to the temple, the elder thug said. We donate every year to the Cancer Institute. I buy that card that the school children come around selling. The other day I was speaking to our accountant and he was saying, Sir, you have no money in your bank. It's all gone. Do you know how high the taxes are in this country? The younger thug said, if we gave any money, what would we have to eat? That was when it struck me that there really was no difference between the two of them. They were both their father's seed. So I just kept that because um, it is part of Balram breaking with his loyalty to Ashok. For the rest of the drive home, the mongoose pointedly kept his eyes on the rear view mirror. He looked as if he had smelled something fishy. So remember the mongoose, the whole name of the mongoose, mongoose has killed snakes. And so the mongoose here, Balram's a bit of a snake. And he's, he's smelt something fishy, meaning he's on to Balram. When we reached Buckingham B, he said, come upstairs, Balram. Yes, sir. We stood side by side in the lift. When he opened the door of the apartment, he pointed to the floor. Make yourself comfortable. So he has to sit on the floor. He doesn't even get a chair. I squatted below the photo of cuddles and puddles. So squatted below the photo of the dogs. Again, this is all meant to symbolise status in this um, in this family or employment relationship. He's below, squatting below a photo of the dogs and put my hands between my knees. He sat down on a chair and rested his face in his palm and just stared at me. His brow was furrowed. I could see a thought forming in his mind. He got up off his chair, walked over to where I was crouched and got down on one knee. He sniffed the air. Your breath smells of aniseed. Yes, sir. People chew that to hide the liquor on their breath. Have you been drinking? No, sir. My cast, we're teetotals. He kept sniffing, coming closer all the time. I took in a big breath held it in the pit of my belly and then forced it out in a belch right to his face. That's disgusting, Balram, he said with a look of horror. He stood up and took two steps back. Sorry, sir. Get out. I came out sweating. The next day I drove him and Mr. Ashok to some minister's or bureaucrat's house in New Delhi. They went out with the red bag. Afterwards I took them to a hotel where they had lunch. I gave the hotel staff instructions, no potatoes in the food, then drove the mongoose to the railway station. I put up with his usual threats and warnings, no AC, no music, no wasting fuel, blah, blah, blah. I stood on the platform and watched as he ate his snack. When the train left, I danced around the platform and clapped my hands. Two homeless urchins were watching me and they laughed, they clapped their hands too. One of them began singing a song from the latest Hindi film and we danced together on the platform. So this bit here, he's, you know, he's, he's not taking the usual threats and warnings seriously anymore. This guy's leaving town and when he's out of town, Baram can do what he likes and he's celebrating that he's gone. Next morning I was in the apartment and Mr. Ashok was fiddling with the red bag and getting ready to leave when the phone began to ring. I said, I'll take the bag down, sir. I'll wait in the car. 
He hesitated, then held the bag out in my direction. I'll join you in a minute. I closed the door of the apartment. I walked to the lift, pressed the button and waited. It was a heavy bag and I had to shift it about in my palm. The lift had reached the fourth floor. I turned and looked at the view from the balcony of the 13th floor. The lights were shining from Gurugaon's malls, even in broad daylight. A new mall had opened in the past week. Another one was under construction. The city was growing. The lift was coming up fast. It was about to reach the 11th floor. I turned and ran. Kicking the door of the fire escape open, hurrying down two flights of dark stairs, I clicked the red bag open. All at once, the entire stairwell filled up with dazzling light, the kind that only money can give out. Twenty minutes later, when Mr. Ashok came down, punching the buttons on his mobile phone, he found the red bag waiting for him on his seat. I held up a shining silver disc as he closed the door. Shall I play Sting for you, sir? As we drove, I tried hard not to look at the red bag. It was torture for me just like when Pinky Madam used to sit in short skirts. At a red light, I saw the rearview mirror. I saw my thick moustache and jaw. I touched the mirror. The angle of the image changed. Now I saw long, beautiful eyebrows curving on either side of powerful, furrowed brow muscles. Black eyes were shining below those tensed muscles. The eyes of a cat watching its prey. So this is Bowron looking at himself, seeing himself for the first time as beautiful and uh, and also as a predator. Go on, just look at the red bag, Bowron. That's not stealing, is it? I shook my head. And even if you were to steal it, Bowron, it wouldn't be stealing. How so? I looked at the creature in the mirror. See, Mr. Ashok is giving money to all these politicians in Delhi so that they will excuse him from the tax he has to pay. And who owns that tax in the end? Who but the ordinary people of this country? You! What is it, Bowron? Did you say something? I tapped the mirror. My moustache rose into view again, and the eyes disappeared, and it was only my own face staring at me now. This fellow in front of me is driving rashly, sir. I was just grumbling. Keep your cool, Bowron. You're a good driver. Don't let the bad ones get to you. The city knew my secret. And this is um, harking back to the previous chapter where he feels like the city um, knows uh, knows stuff and that there's you know this sort of feeling of revolution, uh, revolutionary ideas. It's kind of simmering under the surface. And I, I think this conversation he's having, who's he having it with? With himself in his own head or with this kind of simmering idea of, um, you know, of revolution. And, I mean, he's obviously, he's rationalising a decision to, to steal. Keep your cool, Barham. You're a good driver. Don't let the bad ones get to you. The city knew my secret. One morning, the president's house was covered in smog and blotted out from the road. It seemed as though there was no government in Delhi that day. And the dense pollution that was hiding the Prime Minister and all these ministers and bureaucrats said to me, they won't see a thing you do, I'll make sure of that. I drove past the red wall of Parliament House. A guard with a gun was watching me from a lookout post on the red wall. He put his gun down the moment he saw me. Why would I stop you? I'd do the same if I could. At night a woman walked with a cellophane bag. My headlight shone into the bag and turned the cellophane transparent. I saw four large dark fruits inside the bag and each dark fruit said, you've already done it. In your heart, you've already taken it. Then the headlights passed. The cellophane turned opaque. The four dark fruits vanished. Even the road, the smooth polished road of Delhi, that is the finest in all of India, knew my secret. So there's all those references to the, this, this idea that uh, you know, he's kind of talking to the city. It's a bit obscure and odd, but there you have it. One day at a traffic signal, the driver of the car next to me lowered the window and spat out. He had been chewing pan, pan and a vivid red puddle of expectorate splashed on the hot midday road and festered there like a living thing, spreading and sizzling. A second later, he spat again, and now there was a second puddle on the road. I stared at the two puddles of red spreading spit, and then... 
and this is in in a not on a Kindle but in a book you can see this more clearly in two columns there's two columns here the left hand puddle of spit seemed to say your father wanted you to and then the other side but the right hand puddle of spit seemed to say your father wanted you to be up so let's have a look at the next page left hand puddle be an honest man be a man so the two two puddles uh, are contrasting your father wanted you to be an honest man no 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 he just wanted you to live as a man uh, mr ashok does not hit you or spit on you like people did to your father mr ashok made you take the blame when his wife killed that child on the road Mr. Ashok pays you well, 4,000 rupees a month. He has been raising your salary without you even asking. This is a pittance. You live on in a city. What do you save? Nothing. Remember what the buffalo did to his servant's family. Mr. Ashok will ask his father to do the same to your family once you run away. The very fact that Mr. Ashok threatens your family makes your blood boil. So this last bit's really important. It's it's a he knows he's grappling with should he steal from Ashok? But the bottom line is, even if he's okay with stealing from Ashok, he's also got to be okay with the repercussions for his family. Which and if you go back to what the Buffalo did to the servants family, they will all be killed. I turned my face away from the red puddles. I looked at the red bag sitting in the centre of my rear view mirror like the exposed heart of the Honda City. I love that image. What a ripper. Red bag, back seat, exposed heart of the car. That day I dropped Mr. Ashok off at the Imperial Hotel and he said, I'll be back in 20 minutes, Balram. Instead of parking the car, I drove to the train station, which is in Pahar Ganj, not far from the hotel. So I went and Googled this and found some... Uh, some images of, of the, the train station, which I'll just show you now uh, for, for a few seconds. Um, and people were lying on the floor of the station. Dogs were sniffing at the garbage. The air was mouldy. So this, would, this is what it would be like, I thought. The destinations of all the trains were up on a blackboard. Benares, Jammu, and I can pronounce Mumbai pretty easily, and Ranchi looks okay. What would my what would be my destination if I were to come here with a red bag in my hand? As if in answer, shining wheels and bright lights began flashing in the darkness. Now, if you visit any train station in India, you will see as you stand waiting for your train a row of bizarre looking machines with red light bulbs, kaleidoscopic wheels, and whirling yellow circles. These are your fortune and weight for one rupee machines that stand on every rail platform in the country. They work like this. You put your bags down to the side, you stand on them, then you insert a one rupee coin in the slot. The machine comes to life, levers start to move inside, things go clankety clank and the lights flash like crazy. Then there is a loud noise and a small stiff chit of cardboard coloured Either green or yellow will pop out of the machine. The lights and noise calm down. On this chit will be written your fortune and your weight in kilograms. Okay, so I went and I looked, looked these machines up and uh, got a couple of images for you and then found that uh, as of 2018, they had disappeared. So I thought that was really interesting as well that um, very recently they've been removed from railway stations. But uh, nothing ever stays the same, does it? Two kinds of people use these machines, the children of the rich or the fully grown adults of the poorer class who remain all their lives children. And this is a theme that's that's come up a few times, this idea that, that you can't be a fully fledged adult while you are that poor and you remain a child. So I've, I've just collected that to go with that, that collection of quotes. I stood gazing at the machines like a man without a mind, Six glowing machines were shining at me, light bulbs of green and yellow and kaleidoscopes of gold and black that were turning around and around. I got up on one of the machines. I sacrificed a rupee. It gobbled the coin, made noise, gave off more lights and released a chit. Lunar Scales Company, New Delhi, your weight, 59. Respect for the law is the first command of the gods. I let the fortune teller chit fall on the floor and I laughed. So he's 
This is this is um, pivotal as well. He's been told that it's God's will that you respect the law, and when he's told that, he laughs at it. He doesn't he doesn't believe it. He's not buying it anymore. Even here in the weight machine of a train station, they try to hoodwink us, hoodwink us trick. Here on the threshold of a man's freedom, just before he boards a train to a new life, these flashing fortune machines are the final alarm bell of the rooster coop. So he's seeing the station as a way out. Um, But at the last minute, this thing is meant to come out and say, oh, no, you should respect the Lord. Don't do it. The sirens of the coop were ringing, its wheels turning, its red lights flashing. A rooster was escaping from the coop. A hand was thrust out. I was picked up by the neck and shoved back into the coop. I picked up the chit and reread it. My heart began to sweat. I sat down on the floor. Think, Balram. Think of what the buffalo did to his servant's family. Above me, I heard wings thrashing. Pigeons were sitting on the roof beams all around the station. Two of them had flown from a beam and began wheeling directly over my head as if in slow motion. Pulled into their breasts, I saw two sets of red claws. Not far from me, I saw a woman lying on the floor with nice full breasts inside a tight blouse. She was snoring. I could see a one rupee note stuffed into her cleavage, its lettering and colour visible through the weave of her bright green blouse. She had no luggage. That was all she had in the world, one rupee. And yet look at her, snoring blissfully without a care in the world. Why couldn't things be so simple for me? And there's this idea again that Bowram is different. He's a he's that once in a generation, that ubermensch, man above all men who who can can break the cycle a low growling noise made me turn and 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 the woman is the opposite she's symbolic of the work the lower class that have nothing uh, and yet seem content and they're complacent and they're just letting it all happen sleeping their lives away um, when they could be doing something to, to change things a low growling noise made me turn A black dog was turning in circles behind me. A pink patch of skin, an open wound, glistened on its left butt, and the dog had twisted on itself in an attempt to gnaw at the wound. The wound was just out of its reach, but the dog was going crazy from pain, trying to attack the wound with its slavering mouth. He kept moving in mad, precise, pointless circles. I looked at the slit, and, and I think this this is also a kind of image that's meant to to evoke that idea of people who are suffering, just going round and round and round in circles, tearing themselves to pieces, um, without ever getting anywhere or dealing with what's making them suffer. I looked at the sleeping woman at her heaving breasts. Behind me, the growling went on and on. That Sunday, I asked Mr. Ashok's permission, saying I wanted to go to a temple and went into the city. I took a bus down to Quetub, and from there a jeep taxi down to GB Road. This, Mr Premier, is the famous red light district, as they say in English, of Delhi. And again, I just got on the internet and put in GB Road and and uh, have got some images for you to have a look at of the red light district in Delhi, um, where obviously there's a lot of... Um, a lot of women on the streets where you know people can can see them and and advertisements for you know what can go on in indoors and so forth an hour here would clear all the evil thoughts out of my head thinks Bowram. when you retain semen in your lower body it leads to evil evil movements in the fluids of your upper body in the darkness we know this to be a fact so another example of some of his backward ideas It was just five o'clock and still light, but the women were waiting for me as they wait for all men at all times of the day. Now, I've been to these streets before, and I think that's interesting too. The women were waiting for Bowerman. So the women are below men in in the caste, in in, in India's social structure, and so they're waiting for Bowerman, who's at the lower, lower of the low, as they wait for all men. So no matter how, how low men are, these women are at the mercy, the beck and call of all men at all times of the day. Now, I've been to these streets before, as I've confessed to you, but this time was different. 
I heard them above me, the women, jeering and taunting from the grilled windows of the brothels, but this time I couldn't bear to look up at them. And remember that he this is the second visit to, um, to sex workers he's made in this chapter. A pan maker sat on a wooden stall outside the gaudy blue door of a brothel, using a knife to spread spices on moist leaves that he had picked out of a bowl of water, which is the first step in the preparation of pan. In the small square space below his stall sat another man boiling milk in a vessel over the hissing blue flame of a gas stove. What's the matter with you? Look at the women. The pimp, a small man with a big nose covered in red warts, had caught me by the wrist. You look like you can afford a foreign girl. Take a Nepali girl. Aren't they beauties? Look up at them, son. He took my chin. Maybe he thought I was a shy virgin out on my first expedition here and forced me to look up. The Nepalis up there behind the bar window were really good looking, very light skinned and with those Chinese eyes that just drive us Indian men mad. I shook the pimp's hand off my face. Take any one, take all. Aren't you man enough, son? Normally this would have been enough for me to burst into the brothel, hollering for blood. But sometimes what is most animal in a man may be the best thing in him. From my waist down, nothing stirred. They're like parrots in a cage. It'll be like one, it'll be one animal fucking another animal. So he's saying here that his sex drive is not there. And so what is most animal in a man may be the best thing in him. So it's actually the failure of his sex drive to kick in at this point that uh, allows him to break through and, and, and see things differently. And the idea of one animal fucking another animal is the idea that they're all imprisoned in India. And it's what he failed to see earlier when he visited Anastasia. Um, and he's now revolted by the idea um, of using these women to kind of make himself feel better, that they're all still in the coop. Chew pan, it will help you if you're having trouble getting it up, the seller of pan shouted from his stand. He held up a fresh wet pan leaf and shook it so that the droplets splash, splashed on my face. Drink hot milk, it helps too, shouted the man, the small shrunken man below him who was boiling the milk. I watched the milk. It seethed and spilled down the sides of the stainless steel vessel. The small shrunken man smiled. He provoked the boiling milk with a spoon. It became frothier and frothier, hissing with outrage. I charged into the pan cellar, pushing him off his perch, scattering his leaves and spilling his water. I kicked the midget in the face. Screams broke out from above. The pimps rushed at me, shoving and kicking for dear life. I ran out of that street. Now GB Road is in old Delhi, about which I should say something. Remember, Mr Premier, that Delhi is the capital of not one, but two countries, two Indias. The light and the darkness both flow into Delhi. Gurugayam, where Mr Ashok lived, is the bright modern end of the city, and this place, old Delhi, is the other end, full of things that the modern world forgot all about, rickshaws, old stone buildings and Muslims. So here I, I went online and had a look uh, at some videos of, uh, you know, there's loads and loads and loads of people who've posted videos of walking through Old Delhi and you can go and immerse yourself in that if you want to get more of a feel for what, what he's talking about here. And uh, here they're going to talk a bit about, um, yeah, on Sunday though, there is something more. If you keep pushing through the crowd that is always there, go past the men cleaning the other men's ears by poking rusty metal rods into them past the men selling small fish trapped in green bottles full of brine, past the cheap shoe market and the cheap shirt market, and you will come to the great second-hand book market of Daria Ganj. So again, I put this in um, and found lots of photos and video of um, this very famous place in Delhi. And again, it, it might be something that you'd like to do yourselves and, and take a bit more time with. You may have heard of this market, sir since it is one of the wonders of the world. Tens of thousands of dirty, rotten, blackened books on every subject, technology, medicine, sexual pleasure, philosophy, education, and foreign countries, heaped upon the pavement from Delhi Gate onwards, all the way until you get to the market in front of the Red Fort. Some books are so old they crumble when you touch them. Some have silverfish feasting on them. Some look like they were retrieved from a flood 
or from a fire. Most shops on the pavement are shuttered down, but the restaurants are still open, and the smell of fried food mingles with the smell of rotting paper. Rusting exhaust fans turn slowly in the ventilators of the restaurants, like the wings of giant moths. I went amid the books and sucked in the air. It was like oxygen after the stench of the brothel. And I think that contrast between stench, brothel, something very, very negative, and oxygen um, related to books, you know, knowledge, books, beauty, literature, all of those things are seen as very positive and oxygen feeds you. It gives, it gives you something that you need. To, to go on within life and the two are contrasted with each other. What's the way forward? Is it to go with prostitutes to make yourself feel better or is it to increase your knowledge and um, engage with things that are, are beautiful? There is a, was a thick crowd of book buyers fighting over the books with the sellers and I pretended to be one of the buyers. I leapt into the books, picking them up, reading them like this, flip, 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 until a bookseller shouted, you're going to buy it or read it for free? It's no good, I would say, put the book down and go to the next bookseller and pick up something he had. And flip, 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 never paying anyone a single rupee, flipping through books for free. I kept looting bookseller after bookseller all evening long. Some books were in Urdu, the language of the Muslims, which is all just scratches and dots, as if some cow dipped its feet in black ink and pressed them to the page. I was going through one such book when a bookseller said, can you read Urdu? He was an old Muslim with a pitch black face that was bedewed with sweat like a begonia leaf after the rains and a long white beard. I said, can you read Urdu? He opened the book, cleared his throat and read, you were looking for the key for years. Understand that? He looked at me wide furrows on his black forehead. Yes, Muslim uncle, shut up you liar and listen. He cleared his throat again. You were looking for the key for years, but the door was always open. And this quote highlighted very significant quote. It just basically means you're looking for a way out of where you are, but the door doesn't need a key. It's the answer is obvious. You just go, just take it. He closed the book. That's called poetry. Now get lost. Please, Muslim uncle, I begged. I'm just a rickshaw puller's son from the darkness. Tell me about poetry. Who wrote the poem? He shook his head, but I kept flattering him, telling him how fine his beard was, how fair his skin was, ha, huh, how it was obvious from his nose and forehead that he wasn't some pig herd who had converted, but a true blue Muslim who had flown here on a magic carpet all the way from Mecca. And he grunted with satisfaction. He read me another poem and another one. And he explained the true history of poetry, which is a kind of secret and magic known only to wise men. Mr. Premier, I won't be saying anything new if I say that the history of the world is the history of a 10,000 year war of brains between the rich and the poor. And this actually echoes, this echoes Karl Marx, you know, the, the father of Marxism. Uh, who talked about you know the, the history of, of the world, the history of humanity, is the history of class struggle going back all the way to the beginning, to the first human societies. Each side is eternally trying to hoodwink the other side as it had been this way since the start of time. The poor win a few battles, the peeing in the potted plants, the kicking of pet dogs, etc. So those petty battles, the, the slapping of the ogre in the car and, and, and so forth. But of course, the rich have won, and, and or the stealing of the money and the use of the car and that sort of thing. But of course, the rich have won the war for 10,000 years. That's why one day, some wise men, out of compassion for the poor, left them signs and symbols in poems, which appear to be about roses and pretty girls and things like that but when understood correctly, spill out secrets that allow the poorest man on earth to conclude the 10,000-year-old brain war on terms favourable to himself. So meaning that poetry is not expensive, but it contains, it contains answers and ideas that can allow a poor man to change his, his world, change his, his life, because he reaches understanding. 
Now, the four greatest of these wise poets were Rumi, Iqbal, Mirza, Galib, and another fellow whose name I was told but have forgotten. Who was that fourth poem? It drives me crazy that I can't recall his name. If you know it, send me an email. Muslim uncle, I have another question for you. What do I look like? Your school teacher? Don't keep asking me questions. The last one I promise. Tell me, Muslim uncle, can a man make himself vanish with poetry? You can ask yourself, why would Balram want to vanish? Well, because he's going to take this red bag. What do you mean, like vanish through black magic? He looked at me. Yes, that can be done. There are books for that. You want to buy one? No, not vanish like that. I meant Kenny, Kenny, the bookseller had narrowed his eyes. The sweat beads had grown larger on his huge black forehead. I smiled at him. Forget I asked that Muslim uncle. And then I warned myself never to talk to this old man again. He knew too much already. So Balaam's thinking about leaving and he's thinking, that guy got a bit of an inkling I might be about to do something. My eyes were burning from squinting at books. I should have been heading back towards Delhi Gate to catch a bus. There was a foul taste of book in my mouth, as if I had inhaled so much particulated old paper from the air. Strange thoughts brew in your heart when you spend too much time with old books. So again, there's that idea that within literature and within learning, um, you can you can develop strange thoughts or maybe begin to break with you know ignorance and and come up with new ideas some of which may not be socially acceptable but which may be necessary in order to move you or to move your society forward but instead of going back to the bus i wandered farther into old delhi i had no idea where i was going everything grew quiet the moment i left the main road i saw some men sitting on a charpoy smoking others lying on the ground and sleeping eagles flew above the houses then the wind blew an enormous gust of buffalo into my face everyone knows there is a butcher's quarter somewhere in old delhi but not many have seen it it is one of the wonders of the old city and again i've, I'm, I've had a bit of a look around for some video and photos of, of this part of delhi um, as well to show you you might want to have a look too um, it is one of the wonders of the old city, a row of open sheds and big buffaloes standing in each shed with their butts towards you and their tails swatting flies away like windshield wipers and their feet deep in immense pyramids of shit. I stood there inhaling the smell of their bodies. It had been so long since I had smelled buffalo. The horrible city air was driven out of my lungs. And here you'll see I've highlighted, it's a long quote, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's um, important, obviously. A rattling noise of wooden wheels. I saw a buffalo coming down the road, pulling a large cart behind it. There was no human sitting on this cart with a whip. The buffalo just knew on its own where to go, and it was coming down the road. I stood to the side as it passed me. I saw that this cart was full of the faces of dead buffaloes. Faces, I say, but I should say skulls, stripped even of the skin, except for the little black bit of skin on the tip of the nose, from which the nostril hairs still stuck out, like last defiant bits of the personality of the dead buffalo. The rest of the faces were gone, even the eyes had been gouged out. And the living buffalo walked on without a master, drawing its load of death to the place where it knew it had to go. And this is obviously symbolic, you know, this idea that they're, they're, you don't need a master there with a whip, that the, that the servant class is so well trained and so used to doing what it's told that it will almost virtually govern itself. But that what it's carting around in this, in this wagon, what it's doing, the servant class often is oppressing its own family, its own people, its own self. Um, so, you know, you probably don't need that whole quote, but I thought it was pretty important. I walked along with that poor animal for a while, staring at the dead, stripped faces of the buffaloes. And then the strangest thing that happened, Your Excellency. I swear the buffalo that was pulling the cart turned its face to me and said, in a voice not unlike my father's, Your brother Kishan was beaten to death. Happy? It was like experiencing a nightmare in the minutes before you wake up. You know it's a dream, but you can't wake up just yet. 
Your Aunt Lutu was raped and then beaten to death. Happy? Your grandmother Kusum was kicked to death. Happy? The buffalo glared at me. Shame, it said, and then it took a big step forward, and the cart passed by, full of dead skinned faces, which seemed to me at that moment the faces of my own family. So here, this buffalo, um, when it speaks to him, the voices are a bit like his father's voice. Now his father was the dutiful family member, and and he's a rickshaw puller, so like the buffalo, he's pulling a wagon. Um, and the father here is is accusing Balram. Now this didn't ha- this isn't happening. It's a dream, or a, a, a kind of a hallucination, I suppose. Um, but these are the things that Balram expects will happen to his family. And his father's saying, you know, you you broken with with um, the family and allowed all of these things to happen. Um, and and he's telling him to be ashamed of that. And then the the dead buffalo in the back of the the wagon become the faces of the people that he knows are going to suffer if he takes the money. So then the text breaks again. The next morning, Mr. Ashok came down to the car smiling and with the red bag in his hand, he slammed the door. I looked at the ogre and swallowed hard. Sir, what is it, Balram? Sir, there's something I've been meaning to tell you for a while. And I took my fingers off the initial ignition key. I swear I was ready to make a full confession right there had he said the right word, had he touched my shoulder the right way, which would have been the stupidest thing in the world to do, I have to say, because he's not actually done anything wrong yet, except for um, think about it. Why would you confess and uh, ruin your life? Anyway, it's a book, I suppose, isn't it? But he wasn't looking at me. He was busy with the mobile phone and its buttons, punch, 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 To have a madman with thoughts of blood and theft in his head sitting just 10 inches in front of you and not to know it, not to have a hint even. What blindness you people are capable of. And here you are sitting in glass buildings and talking on the phone night after night to Americans who are thousands of miles away, but you don't have the faintest idea what's happening to the man who's driving your car. And, of course, this is is a comment about Balram, one servant, but it's also a criticism of all of the rich of India who don't see what could be happening with the poor. What is it, Balram? Just this, sir, that I want to smash his skull open. Of course, he hasn't said that. That's just what's in his head. He leans forward. He brought his lips right to my ear. I was ready to melt. I understand, Balram. I closed my eyes. I could barely speak. You do, sir? You want to get married? Balram, you'll need money, won't you? No, sir, there's no need of that. Wait, Balram, let me take out my wallet. You're a good member of the family. You never ask for more money. I know that other drivers are constantly asking for overtime and insurance, but you never say a word. You're old-fashioned. I like that. We'll take care of all the wedding expenses. Balram, here, Balram, here's, here's. I saw him take out a thousand rupee note. Put it back then take out a 500, then put it back, and take out a 100, which he handed to me. And this this here is showing him downscaling his regard for Balram from 1,000 to 500 to 100, and then isolating that little sentence off. Just really rams home that in, the insult, insult sorry, that's involved in that because um, it's... Uh, 100 rupee is two dollars or in Australian money or a dollar fifty US at the current exchange rate of 2019 um, so it's it's ridiculous I assume you'll be going to Lax Manga for the wedding Balram maybe I'll come along he said oh, I really like that place I want to go up to that fort this time how long ago was it that we were there Balram six months ago longer than that sir I counted the months off on my fingers eight months ago he counted the months too. Why, you're right. I folded the 100 rupee note and put it in my chest pocket. Thank you for this, sir, I said, and turned the ignition key. Early next morning, I walked out of Buckingham B onto the main road. Though it was a brand new building, there was already a leak in the drainage pipe and a large patch of sewage darkened the earth outside the compound wall. Three stray dogs were sleeping on the wet patch. 
a good way to cool off. Summer had started, and even the nights were unpleasant now. The three mutts seemed so comfortable. I got down on my haunches and watched them. I put my finger on the dark sewage puddle. So cool, so tempting. One of the dogs woke up. It yawned and showed me all its canines. It sprang to its feet. The other mutts got up too. A growling began and a scratching of the wet mud and a showing of teeth. They wanted me off their kingdom. I surrendered the sewage to the dogs and headed for the malls. None of them had opened yet. I sat down on the pavement. So here I see this also is, is symbolic that we've got um, Buckingham Towers number B, which is the world of the rich. Its sewage is leaking. I mean, it's the, the, a brand new building. There's a leak in a drain pipe, which is symbolic of, of, of India and it's just uselessness. And the sewage, which is symbolic of the worst in the world, wor the worst aspects of everything, uh, the, you know, and it darkens the earth outside the compound wall. So for the poor, they get this leak of sewage from the rich. And then these stray dogs, which I think represent the poor, are sleeping on that wet, pay, wet, wet patch, trying to cool off or get something from it. And, uh, and they seem comfortable there. And he, he says um, that it's tempting. They seem so comfortable, so cool, so tempting. So should he just relax with them in this sewage puddle that is the world of the poor? Um, they growl at him and he leaves them to it and he heads for the moors. No idea where to go next. That's when I saw the small dark marks in the pavement, paw prints. So we had dogs just before. We've got concrete now with paw prints. And he, an animal had walked on the concrete before it had set. I got up and walked after the animal. The space between the prints grew wider. The animal had begun to sprint. So there's that idea of running and maybe an animal escaping the, is the paw. And maybe also the idea that prints are in the... The concrete may be making a mark on society as well. I walked faster. The paw prints of the accelerating animal went all the way around the malls and then behind the malls and at last where the pavement ended and raw earth began, they vanished. And is this, does this symbolise Balram running and vanishing, disappearing, getting away from poverty? But then the metaphor gets mixed up here because he's on the edge of a slum. So I don't know. Here I had to stop because five feet ahead of me, a row of men squatted on the ground in a nearly perfect straight line. They were defecating, which means they were pooing. I was at the slum. Vitiligo Lips had told me about this place. All these construction workers who were building the malls and giant apartment buildings lived here. They were from a village in the darkness. They did not like outsiders coming in, except for those who had business after dark. The men were defecating in the open, like a defensive wall in front of the slum, making a line that no respectable human should cross. The wind wafted the stench of fresh shit towards me. I found a gap in the line of the defecators. They squatted there like stone statues. These people were building homes for the rich, but they lived in tents covered with blue tarpaulin sheets and partitioned into lanes by lines of sewage. It was even worse than Lax Manga. And again, if you have time... Just have a look at some of the slums. It's really easy to find videos uh, and photos of these slums in big Indian cities. And that's exactly what they look like. They're, they're houses made out of, of sacks and tarpaulins and so forth. And of course, they don't have um, really adequate hygiene and, and so forth plumbing. I picked my way around the broken glass wire and shattered light tube lights. The stench of faeces was replaced by the strongest stench of industrial sewage. The slum ended in an open sewer. A small black river, a small river of black water went sluggishly past me, bubbles sparkling in it and little circles spreading on its surface. Two children were splashing about in the black water. A hundred rupee note came flying down into the river. The children watched with open mouths and then ran to catch the note before it floated away. One child caught it and then the other began hitting him and they began to tumble about in the black water as they fought. Now remember, Balaam's just been given a hundred rupee note by Ashok. So the reappearance of a hundred, um, hundred rupee note, I don't know if we're meant to assume that Balaam has chucked his note into the river uh, there or whether it's just another random one. But 
what is significant is is that this is a, a river of, of human waste and we've got the children of the poor fighting over something that's worth very little, um, which is kind of what, you know, part of that extended criticism of poor people and the fact that they fight each other rather than turning their attentions to changing the system. I went back to the line of crappers and, of course, Bowram sort of, you know, saying this 100 rupee note, is he going to covet this small token um, or should he go after something better? I went back to the line of crappers. One of them had finished up and left, but his position had been filled. I squatted down with them and grinned. A few immediately turned their eyes away. They were still human beings. Some stared at me blankly as if shame no longer mattered to them. And then I saw one fellow, a thin black fellow, was grinning back at me as if he was proud of what he was doing. Still crouching, I moved myself over to where he was squatting and faced him. I smiled as wide as I could. So did he. He began to laugh and I began to laugh. And then all the crappers laughed together. We'll take care of your wedding expenses, I shouted. We'll take care of your wedding expenses, he shouted back. We'll even fuck your wife for you, Balram. We'll even fuck your wife for you, Balram. He began laughing, laughing so violently that he fell down face first into the ground, still laughing, exposing his stained ass to the stained sky of Delhi. As I walked back, the malls had begun to open. I washed my face in the common toilet and wiped my hands clean of the slum. I walked into the car park, found an iron wrench, aimed a couple of practice blows and then took it to my room. A boy was waiting for me near my bed. So this, this here, he's got the wrench, he's aiming practice blows, he's making a decision to kill. A boy was waiting for me near my bed, holding a letter between his teeth as he adjusted the buttons on his pants. He turned around when he heard me. The letter flew out of his mouth and to the ground. The wrench fell out of my hand at the same time. They sent me here. I took the bus and train and asked people and came here. He blinked. They said you have to take care of me and make me a driver too. Who the hell are you? Dharam, he said. I'm Lutu Auntie's fourth son. You saw me when you came to Lex Manga last time. I was wearing a red shirt. You kissed me here, he pointed to the top of his head. Picking up the letter, he held it out to me. Dear grandson, it has been a long time since you came to visit us, and an even longer time, a total of 11 months and two days, since you last sent us any money. The city has corrupted your soul and made you selfish, vain, vain, glorious and evil. I'm going to keep that. There. I knew from the start that this would happen because you were a spiteful, insolent boy. Every chance you got, you just stared at yourself in a mirror with open lips and I had to wring your ears to make you do any work. You're just like your mother. It is her nature and not your father's sweet nature that you have. So far, we have borne our sufferings patiently, but we will not do so. You must send us money again. If you don't, we'll tell your master. Also, we have decided to arrange for your wedding on our own. And if you do not come here, we will send the girl to you by bus. I say these things not to threaten you, but out of love. After all, am I not your own grandmother? And how I used to stuff your mouth with sweets. Also, it is your duty to look after Dara and take care of him as if he was your own son. Now take care of your health and remember that I am preparing lovely chicken dishes for you, which I will send to you by mail, along with the letter that I will write to your master, your loving granny, Kusum. So she's going to dob him in as well. I folded the letter, put it in my pocket, and then slapped the boy so hard that he staggered back, hit the side of the bed, and fell into it, pulling down the mosquito net as he fell. There's lots of examples in the text of Bowron behaving badly, and here's another one. So there are many examples also of him behaving well. So you've got a lot there to discuss in terms of weighing him up. Um, he certainly uh, shouldn't have hit Durham. Get up, I said, I'm going to hit you again. I picked up the wrench and held it over him, then threw it to the floor. The boy's face had turned blue and his lip was split and bleeding and he still hadn't said a word. I sat on the mosquito net, sipping from a half bottle of whiskey. I watched the boy. I had come to the edge of the precipice. I find that word so hard to say. It means a cliff. Precipice. I had come to the edge of the precipice. I had been ready to slay my master, 
This boy's arrival had saved me from murder and a lifetime in prison. So he was ready to do it. Now he won't. That evening, I told Mr. Ashok that my family had sent me a helper, someone to keep the car tidy, and instead of getting angry that he would not now have another mouth to feed, which is what most masters would have done, he said, He's a cute boy. He looks like you. What happened to his face? I turned to Dharam. Tell him. He blinked a couple of times. He was thinking it over. I fell off the bus. Smart boy. Take care of the future, Mr. Ashok said. This is great, Balan. You'll have company from now on. Dharam was a quiet little fellow. He didn't ask for anything from me. He slept on the floor where I told him to. He minded his own business. Feeling guilty for what I'd done, I took him to the tea shop. Who teaches at the school these days, Dharam? Is it still Mr. Krishna? Yes, uncle. Is he still stealing money for, for the school uniforms and the food? Yes, uncle. Good man. I went for five years and then Kusum Granny said that was enough. Let's see what you've learned in five years. Do you know the eight times table? Yes, uncle. Let's hear it. Eight ones are eight. That's easy. What's next? Eight twos are 16. Wait. I counted out on my fingers to make sure he got it right. So Balan doesn't know he's what two eights are without counting on his fingers. All right, go on. Order me a tea too, won't you? Vitiligo Lips sat down next to me. He smiled at Darham. Order it yourself, I said. He pouted. Is that any way for you to be talking to me, working class hero? Darham was watching us keenly, so I said, this boy is from my village, from my family. I'm talking to him now. Eight threes are 24. I don't care who he is, Vitiligo Lips said. Order me a tea, working class hero. He flexed his palm near my face, five fingers. That meant... I want 500 rupees. I've got nothing. Eight fours are 32. He drew a line across his neck and smiled. Your master will know everything. So he's going to, he's now threatening Balan that he's going to uh, expose him to Ashok as well. So Balan's now being threatened by Granny Kusum. He's being threatened by um, Vitiligo Lips. What's your name, boy? Dharam. What a nice name. Do you know what it means? Yes, sir. Does your uncle know what it means? Shut up, I said. So I didn't really know what it meant. Um, so the best I could do was um, this thing, Dharma, is uh, duty or moral law, and it seems to be um, important in a number of those religions. And in the Urban Dictionary, I found Dharam means um, this duty in action, righteous behavior, to be in the right place at the right time, to act without creating more karma, serving others, acting from compassion and not personal interest, walking a spiritual path, living with purpose or destiny versus acting from fate and not just going along with whatever circumstance dictates. That's all I could get out of that. But um, here we go. Shut up, I said. It was the time of day when the tea shop got cleaned. One of the human spiders dropped a wet rag on the floor and started to crawl with it, pushing a growing wavelet of stinking ink black water ahead of him. Even the mice scampered out of the shop. The customers sitting at the tables were not spared. The black puddles splashed them as it passed. Bits of bebedus, shiny plastic wrappers, punched bus tickets, snippets of onions, sprigs of fresh coriander floated on the black water. The reflection of a naked electric bulb shone, shone out of the scum like a yellow gemstone. As the black water went past, a voice inside me said, but your heart has become even blacker than that, Munna. That night, Dharam woke up when he heard the shrieking. So your heart has become even blacker. So your heart is concerned at how bad his, his thoughts are. That night, Dharam woke up when he heard the shrieking. He came to the mosquito net. Uncle, what's going on? Turn on the light, you fool. Turn on the light. He did so and saw me paralyzed inside the net. I could not even point at the thing. A thick-bodied grey gecko had come down from the wall and was on my bed. Dharam began to grin. I'm not joking, you moron. Get it off my bed. He stuck his hand into the net, grabbed the lizard and smashed it under his foot. Throw it somewhere far, far away, outside the room, outside the apartment building. I saw the bewildered look in his eyes. Afraid of a lizard, a grown man like my uncle. Good, I thought, just as he was turning off the lights. He'll never suspect that I'm planning anything. Now, I, could, I, I wasn't sure how to read this moment. Did, has, is he no longer afraid of, of lizards? And lizards represent 
you know, ignorance and, and um, fear, irrational fears and the inability to move forward. And has he, you know, created this this scene to throw Dharam off the trail or is he still afraid of lizards? But once the lizard's gone, uh, he's able to, to see it that way. I wasn't quite sure. An instant later, my grid faded. What was I planning? I began to sweat. I stared at the anonymous palm prints that had been pressed into the white plaster of the wall. A cane began tapping on concrete. The night watchman of Buckingham B was doing his rounds with his long cane. When the tapping of the cane died out, there was no noise inside the room except for the buzzing of the cockroaches as they chewed on the walls or flew about. It was another hot, humid night. Even the cockroaches must have been sweating. I could barely breathe. Just when I thought I'd never go to sleep, I began reciting a couplet over and over again. I was looking for the key for years, but the door was already always open. And then I was asleep. And then there's a little break with an asterisk and we're on to something else. I should have noticed the stencil signs on the walls in which a pair of hands smashed through shackles. I should have stopped and listened to the young men in red headbands shouting from the trucks, but I'd been so wrapped up in my own troubles that I had paid no attention at all to something very important that was happening to my country. So remember the, sh uh, the hands breaking out? That's the Great Socialist Party uh, from where Balram comes from in the countryside. Two days later, I was taking Mr. Ashok down to Lodi Gardens along with Miss Uma. He was spending more and more time with her these days. The romance was blossoming. My nose was getting used to her perfume. I no longer sneezed when she moved. So you still haven't done it, Ashok. Is it going to be like last time all over again? What are they discussing, do you think? I think what they're talking about is that Ashok hasn't, hasn't told his family about this girl that he wants to be with. And last time, this is because they've been together before. It's not so simple, Uma. Makesh and I have had a fight over you already. I will put my foot down, but give me some time. I need to get over the divorce. Bowram, why have you turned the music up so loud? I like it loud. It's romantic. Maybe he's done it deliberately. Look, it'll happen. Trust me. It's just Bowram. Why the hell haven't you turned the music down? Sometimes these people from the darkness are so stupid. I told you that already, Ashok. Her voice dropped. I caught the words replacement, driver, and local in English. Have you thought about getting a replacement driver, a local driver? He mumbled, mumbled his reply. I could not hear a word, but I did not have to. I looked at the rearview mirror. I wanted to confront him eye to eye, man to man, but he wouldn't look at me in the mirror, didn't dare face me. Now, um, I tell you, you could have heard the grinding of my teeth just then. I thought I was making plans for him. He'd been making plans for me. The rich are always one step ahead of us, aren't they? So now Balan finds that Ashok is secretly planning on getting rid of him, getting a different driver, probably at the prompting of his new girlfriend. Well, not this time. For every step he'd take, I'd take two Outside on the road, a street-side vendor was sitting next to a pyramid of motorbike helmets that were wrapped in plastic and looked like a pile of severed heads. Just when we were about to reach the gardens, we saw that the road was blocked on all sides. A line of trucks had gathered in front of us, full of men who were shouting, Hail the great socialist! Hail the voice of the poor of India! What the hell is going on? Haven't you seen the news today, Ashok? They are announcing the results. Fuck, he said! Bowram, turn Enya off and turn on the radio. The voice of the great socialist came on. He was being interviewed by a radio reporter. The election shows that the poor will not be ignored. The darkness will not be silent. There is no water in our taps. And what do you people in Delhi give us? You give us mobile phones. Can a man drink a phone when he's thirsty? Women walk for miles every morning to find a bucket of clean... Do you want to become Prime Minister of India? Don't ask me such questions. I have no ambitions for myself. I am simply the voice of the poor and the disenfranchised. But surely, sir, let me say one word if I may. All I have ever wanted was an India where any boy in any village could dream of becoming prime minister. Now, as I was saying, women walk for... So he's still spouting all of that rhetoric that he's really for the poor, but we actually know he's, he's not really. 
And now he's moving up even closer to um, being the Prime Minister. According to the radio, the ruling party had been hammered at the polls. A new set of parties had come to power. The Great Socialist Party was one of them. He had taken the votes of a big part of the darkness. As we drove back to Gurugayon, we saw hordes of his supporters pouring in from the darkness. They drove where they wanted, did what they wanted, whistled at any woman they felt like whistling at. Delhi had been invaded. So they're basically acting like thugs. Mr Ashok did not call me the rest of the day. In the evening, he came down and said he wanted to go to the Imperial Hotel. He was on the mobile phone the whole time, punching buttons and making calls and screaming. We're totally fucked, Uma. This is why I hate this business I'm in. We're at the mercy of these... Don't yell at me, Mukesh. You were the one who said the elections were a foregone conclusion. Yes, you. And now we'll never get out of our income tax mess. All right, I'm doing it, Father. I'm going to meet him right now at the Imperial. He was still on the phone when I dropped him off at the Imperial Hotel. 42 minutes passed, and then he came out with two men. Leaning down to the window, he said, Do whatever they want, Balram. I'm taking a taxi back from here. When they're done, bring the car back to Buckingham. Yes, sir. So here, um, they, remember they, they usually pay both sides in the election, but they were so sure that the ruling party was going to win that they haven't paid the other side. So now they're scrambling to try and make amends with the people they haven't bribed who've just won government. The two men slapped him on the back. He bowed and opened the door, doors for them himself. If he was kissing ass like this, they had to be politicians. The two men got in. My heart began to pound. The man on the right was my childhood hero, VJ, the pig herd son turned bus conductor turned politician from Lax Mangar. He had changed uniforms again. Now he was wearing the polished suit and tie of a modern Indian businessman. He ordered me to drive towards Ashoka Road. He turned to his companion and said, the sister fucker finally gave me his car. The other man grunted. He lowered the window and spat. He knows he has to show us some respect now, doesn't he? VJ chortled. He raised his voice. Do you have anything to drink in this car, son? I turned around. Fat nuggets of gold were studded into his rot rotting black molars. Now, VJ obviously is a really important character in this text and his rise up through the system where he's kind of embraced corruption um, has allowed him to rise up through the system and that's obviously that's a, a possibility that Bowron himself might have followed um, but it's not presented as a positive thing and uh, a noble thing it's obviously presented as something fairly negative and I think that this is meant to symbolize that the fat nuggets of gold sort of fat being a bit of a a, a negative kind of word um, nuggets of gold and nuggets large so this sort of large gaudy fat nuggets of wealth studded into rot rotting black molars so his teeth are fundamentally corrupt and rotting but this gold is kind of there to dress it up so it's a really negative kind of image that's used there to symbolize vj and, and you'd be well served to kind of use that somehow in your discussion Yes, sir. Let's see it. I opened the glove compartment and handed him the bottle. It's good stuff. Johnny Walker Black. Son, do you have glasses too? Yes, sir. Ice? No, sir. It's all right. Let's drink it neat. Son, pour us a drink. I did so while keeping the Honda City going with my left hand. They took the glasses and drank the whiskey like it was lemon juice. If he doesn't have it already, let me know. I'll send some boys over to have a word with him. No, don't worry. His father always paid up in the end. This kid has been to America and has his head full of shit, but he'll pay up too in the end. I just saved that quote for Ashok um, about him having been to America and, and it having filled him up with all of these ideas that just don't fit India. How much? Seven. I was going to settle for five, but the sister fucker himself offered six. He's a bit soft in the head. And then I said seven, and he said, okay. I told him if he didn't pay, we'd screw him and his father and his brother and the whole colf pilfering and tax evading racket they have. So he began to sweat, and I know he'll pay up. I just highlighted the coal pilfering and tax evading racket because it would be useful if you were writing about their family and what they're up to. How, how Are you sure? I'd love to send some boys over. I'd just love to see a rich man roughed up. It's better than an erection. There will be others. This one isn't worth the trouble. 
He said he'll bring it on Monday. We're going to do it at the Sheraton. There's a nice restaurant down in the basement, quiet place. So these formerly poor men are really enjoying uh, uh, pay, you know, a bit of revenge, a bit of payback on the rich as they are now working their way up. Good, he can buy us dinner as well. Goes without saying, they have lovely kebabs there. One of the two men gargled the scotch in his mouth, gulped it down, burped and sucked his teeth. You know what the best part of this election is? What? The way we spread down south, we've got a foothold in Bangalore too, and you know that's where the future is. The south? Bullshit. Why not? One in every three new office buildings in India is being built in Bangalore. It is the future. Fuck all that. I don't believe a word. The south is full of Tamils. You know who the Tamils are? Negroes. We're the sons of the Aryans who came to India. We made them our slaves. And now they give us lectures? Negroes? Son, BJ leaned forward with his glass. Another drink for me? I poured them out the rest of the bottle that night. At around three in the morning, I drove the city back to the apartment block in Gurugayon. My heart was beating so fast, I didn't want to leave the car at once. I wiped it down and washed it three times over. The bottle was lying on the floor of the car. Johnny Walker Black. Even an empty one is worth money on the black market. I picked it up and went towards the servant's dormitory. For a Johnny Walker Black, vitiligo lips wouldn't mind being woken up. I walked, rotating the bottle with my wrist, feeling its weight. Even empty, it wasn't so light. I noticed that my feet were slowing down and the bottle was rotating faster and faster. I was looking for the key for years. The smashing of the bottle echoed through the hollow of the car park. The sound must have reached the lobby and ricocheted through all the floors of the building, even to the 13th floor. I waited for a few minutes, expecting someone to come running, down. No one. I was safe. I held what was left of the bottle up to the light, long and cruel and claw-like jags. Perfect. With my foot, I gathered the broken pieces of the bottle which lay all around me into a pile. I wiped the blood off my hand, found a broom and swept the area clean. Then I got down on my knees and looked around for any pieces I had failed to pick up. The car park echoed with the line of a poem that was being recited over and over, but the door was always open. So the answer's there. He just has to do it. Durham was sleeping on the floor. Cockroaches were crawling about his head. I shook him awake and said, lie inside the mosquito net. He got in sleepily. I lay on the floor, braving the cockroaches. There was still some blood on my palm. Three small red drops had formed on my flesh like a row of ladybirds on a leaf. Sucking my palm like a boy, I went to sleep. And it's interesting that he's moved Darren under the mosquito net. There's these little sprinklings of kindness that pop out every now and again uh, that kind of mark him as, as not, a, not an evil person. Mr. Ashok did not want me to drive him anywhere on Sunday morning. I washed the dishes in the kitchen, wiped the fridge and said, I'd like to take the morning off, sir. Why, he asked, lowering the newspaper. You've never asked for a whole morning off before. Where, where are you off to? And you've never before asked me where I was going when I left the house. What has Miss Uma done to you? I want to spend some time with the boy, sir, at the zoo. I thought he would like to see some of those animals. He smiled. You're a good family man, Balram. Go have fun with the boy. He went back to reading his newspaper. But I caught a gleam of cunning in his eye as he went over the English print of the newspaper. As he, so there's Ashok. He's noticing some changes in Ashok, um, probably caused by this Miss Uma. As we walked out of Buckingham Towers number B block, I told Durham to wait for me, then went back and watched the entrance to the building. Half an hour passed, and then Mr. Ashok was down at the lobby. A small dark man of the servant class had come to see him. Mr. Ashok and he talked for a while, and then the small man bowed and left. They looked like two men who had just concluded a deal. And I think here, this is this is the new driver that, that Ashok, or at least Bowram believes this is the new driver. I went back to where Durham was waiting. Let's go. He and I took the bus to the old fort, which is where the National Zoo is. I kept my hand on Durham's head the whole time. He must have thought it was out of affection, but it was only to stop my hand from trembling. It had been shaking all morning like a lizard's tail that has fallen off. The first strike would be mine. So he, he sees it's coming. A 
back shot's going to fire him. Granny's going to dob him in. Vitiligo Lips is going to blackmail him. He's not going to let all this happen to him. The first strike would be mine. Everything was in place now. Nothing could go wrong. But like I told you, I am not a brave man. The bus was crowded and the two of us had to stand for the entire journey. We both sweated like pigs. I had forgotten what a bus trip in summer was like. When we stopped at a red light, a Mercedes-Benz pulled up alongside the bus. Behind his upraised window, cool in his egg, the chauffeur grinned at us, exposing red teeth. There was a long line at the ticket counter at the zoo. There were lots of families wanting to go into the zoo, and that I could understand. What puzzled me, though, was the sight of so many young men and women going into the zoo, hand in hand, giggling, pinching each other and making eyes as if the zoo were a romantic place. That made no sense to me. Now, Mr. Premier, every day thousands of foreigners fly into my country for enlightenment. They go to the Himalayas or to Benares or to Bodh Gaya. They get into weird poses of yoga, smoke hashish, shag a sadhu or two, and think they're getting enlightened. Ha! If it's enlightenment you have come to India for, you people, forget the Ganga, forget the ashrams, go straight to the National Zoo in the heart of Delhi. Dharam and I saw gold-beaked storks sitting on palm trees in the middle of an artificial lake. They swooped down over the green water of the lake and showed us traces of pink on their wings. In the background, you could see the broken walls of the old fort. And I think when I read this, I thought that these gold-beaked things could be symbolic. And the fact that it's an artificial lake, that there's something, that there's something not quite... Um, authentic about the beauty um, but anyway the second time I read it, I'm not so sure about that Iqbal that great poet was so right the moment you recognize what is beautiful in this world you stop being a slave to hell with the Naxals and their guns shipped from China if you taught every poor boy how to paint that would be the end of the rich in India I made sure Durham appreciated the gorgeous rise and fall of the forts outline the way its loopholes filled up with the blue sky, the way the old stones glittered in the light. We walked for half an hour from cage to cage. The lion and the lioness were apart from each other and not talking, like a true city couple. The hippo was lying in a giant pond full of mud. Darren wanted to do what others were doing, throw a stone at the hippo to stir it up, but I told him that would be a cruel thing. Hippos lie in mud and do nothing. That's their nature. Let animals live like animals. Let humans live like humans. That's my whole philosophy in a sentence. I told Durham it was time to leave, but he made faces and pleaded, Five minutes, Uncle. All right, five minutes. We came to an enclosure with tall bamboo bars, and there, seen in the interstices, interstices I don't know that word, of the bars. What are they? Let's have a little look. Do a little dictionary on them. It's not a word I know. An intervening space, especially a very small one. Ah, yes. Nice. I've just expanded my vocabulary. Interstices of the bars as it paced back and forth in a straight line was a tiger. And if you Google this zoo, actually you'll find pictures of uh, the white, white tiger. It's a very famous um, animal in the zoo. And I'll just mention that you know, traveling, I don't like zoos very much, but modern ones aren't too bad. I just remember a horrific experience to a zoo in, I think it was Bukatingi in Sumatra about 20 years ago when I was traveling there and seeing, it's never left me the sight of these, um, of tigers and other large animals in, in tiny cages with bars on the front. It's never left me, that image. Okay, so not any kind of tiger. The creature that gets born only once every generation in the jungle. I watched him walk behind the bamboo bars, black stripes and sunlit white fur fleur, fleur, fleur flash through the slits in the dark bamboo. It was like watching the slowed down reels of an old black and white film. He was walking in the same line again and again, from one end of the bamboo bars to the other, then turning around and repeating it over and over at exactly the same pace, like a thing under a spell. He was hypnotizing himself by walking like this. That was the only way he could tolerate the cage. Now we've got to see that this is representative of Balram. 
but he's, you know, at various points in his life, he's been able to almost hypnotise himself to to cope with his existence um, in in his life. Um, then the thing behind the bamboo bars stopped moving. It turned its face to my face. The tiger's eyes met my eyes, like my master's eyes have met mine so often in the mirror of the car. All at once the tiger vanished. A tingling went from the base of my spine into my groin. My knees began to shake. I felt light. Someone near me shrieked. His eyes are rolling. He's going to faint. I tried to shout back at her. It's not true. I'm not fainting. I tried to show them all I was tried to show them all I was fine, but my feet were slipping. The ground beneath me was shaking. Something was digging its way towards me, and then claws tore out of the mud and dug into my flesh and pulled me down into the dark earth. And we're meant to be reminded here of, of that uh, those images which he began with of of being sucked into the mud of the Ganga um, and his sort of fear of never ever getting out of it. My last thought before everything went dark was that now I understood those pinches and raptures. Now I understood why lovers came to the zoo. I don't get that bit. You can interpret that. I don't get it. That evening, Durham and I sat on the floor in my room and I spread a blue letter before him. I put a pen in his hands. I'm going to see how good a letter writer you are, Durham. I want you to write to Granny and tell her what happened today at the zoo. He wrote it down in his slow, beautiful hand. He told her about the hippos and the chimpanzees and the swamp deer. Tell her about the tiger. He hesitated, then wrote, We saw a white tiger in a cage. Tell her everything. He looked at me and wrote, Uncle Balram fainted in front of the white tiger in the cage. Better still, I'll dictate. Write it down. He wrote it down for ten minutes, writing so fast that his pen got black and oozy with overflowing ink. He stopped to wipe the nib against his hair and went back to the writing. In the end, he read out what he had written. I called out to the people around me and we carried Uncle to a banyan tree. Someone poured water on his face. The good people slapped Uncle hard and made him wake up. They turned to me and said, Your uncle is raving. He's saying goodbye to his grandmother. And that's what we need to interpret this letter as, as him saying goodbye to his grandmother. He must think he's going to die. Uncle's eyes were open now. Are you all right, Uncle? I asked. He took my hand and he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I asked, sorry for what? And he said, I can't live the rest of my life in a cage, Granny. I'm so sorry. So here he's actually saying sorry to Granny for what he's about to do and explaining that he can't live the rest of his life in a cage. We took the bus back to Gurugayan and had lunch at the tea shop. It was very hot and we sweated a lot. And that was all that happened today. Write whatever you want to her after that to her and post it tomorrow as soon as I leave in the car, but not before, understand? So here, this letter is going to arrive at Granny's after the murder's been completed, so, um, but not before. He's not really alerting her to what's coming, but explaining. It was raining all morning, a light, persistent kind of rain. I heard the rain, though I could not see it. I went to the Honda City, placed the incense stick inside, wiped the seats, wiped the stickers and punched the ogre in the mouth. I threw a bundle near the driver's seat. I shut all the doors and locked them. Then taking two steps back from the Honda City, I bowed low to it with folded palms. I went to see what Durham was doing. He was looking lonely, so I made a paper boat for him and we sailed it in the gutter outside the apartment block. After lunch, I called Durham to my room. I put my hands on his shoulders. Slowly I turned him around so he faced away from me. I dropped a rupee coin on the ground. Bend down and pick that up. He did so and I watched. Durham combed his hair just like Mr. Ashok did with a parting down the middle. When you stood up over him, there was a clear white line down his scalp leading up to the spot on the crown where the strands of a man's hairline radiate from. Stand up straight. I turned him around a full circle. I dropped the rupee again. Pick it up one more time. I watched the spot, telling him to sit in a corner of the room and keep watch over me. I went inside my mosquito net, folded my legs, closed my eyes, touched my palms to my knees and breathed in. I don't know how long I sat like the Buddha, but it lasted until one of the servants shouted out that I was wanted at the front door. I opened my eyes. 
Adaram was sitting in a corner of the room watching me. Come here, I said. I gave him a hug and put ten rupees in his pocket. He'd need that. Baram, you're late. The bell is ringing like crazy. I walked to the car, inserted the key and turned the engine on. So at this stage he's intending to leave Dharam behind. But again, there are small bits of kindness there, you know, making the paper boat for him, playing with him, giving him a hug um, and giving him this money. Baram, Baram, you're late. The bell is ringing like crazy. I walked to the car, inserted the key and turned the engine on. Mr. Ashok was standing at the entrance with an umbrella and a mobile phone. He was talking on the phone as he got into the car and slammed the door. I still can't believe it. The people of this country had a chance to put an efficient ruling party back in power and instead they have voted in the most outrageous bunch of thugs. We don't deserve... He put the phone aside for a moment and said, First to the city, Bowen. I'll tell you where, and then resumed the phone talk. The roads were greasy with mud and water. I drove slowly. Parliamentary democracy, Father. We will never catch up with China for this single reason. And I just highlighted that because he's talking about China and that this is a whole um, series of letters to the Chinese Premier and that and, and, it, and it relates to that initial discussion in the opening chapters of, you know, of, you know whether democracy in, in India has actually benefited, supposed democracy has actually benefited the people there um, and... Um, so forth. So I'll keep going. First stop was in the city, in the city at one of the usual banks. He took the red bag and went in, and I saw him inside the glass booth, pressing the buttons on the cash machine. When he came back, I could feel that the weight of the bag on the back seat had increased. We went from bank to bank, and the weight of the red bag grew. I felt its pressure increase on my lower back, as if I were taking Mr. Ashok and his bag, not in the car, but the way my father would take a customer and his bag in a rickshaw. 700,000 rupees. It was enough for a house, a motorbike and a small shop, a new life. My 700,000 rupees. Now to the Sheraton Baron. Yes, sir. I turned the key, started the car, changed gear. We moved. Play some Sting Baron, not too loud. Yes, sir. I put the CD on. The voice of Sting came on. The car picked up speed. In a little while, we passed the famous bronze statue of Gandhi leading his followers from darkness to light. A little bit of symbolism there, perhaps, as Bowram heads from darkness to light. Now the road emptied. The rain was coming down lightly, lightly. If we kept going this way, we would come to the hotel, the grandest of all in the capital of my country, the place where visiting heads of state, like yourself, always stay. But Delhi is a city where civilization can appear and disappear. Within five minutes, on either side of us right now, there was just wilderness and rubbish. In the rear view mirror, I saw him paying attention to nothing but his mobile phone. A blue glow from the phone lit up his face. Without looking up, he asked me, What's wrong, Bowen? Why has the car stopped? I touched the magnetic stickers of the goddess Kali for luck, then opened the glove compartment. There it was, the broken bottle with its claws of glass. There's something off with the wheel, sir. Just give me a couple of minutes. Before I could even touch it, I swear the door of the car opened. I was out in the drizzle. There was soggy black mud everywhere. Picking my way over mud and rainwater, I squatted, squatted near the left rear wheel, which was hidden from the road by the body of the car. There was a large clump of bushes to one side and a stretch of wasteland beyond. You've never seen the road this empty. You'd swear it had been arranged just for you. Interesting that now he's addressing you, you, you. The only light inside the car was the blue glow from his mobile phone. I rapped against his glass with a finger. He turned to me without lowering the window. I mouthed out the words, there's a problem, sir. He did not lower the window. He did not step out. He was playing with his mobile phone, punching the buttons and grinning. He must be sending a message to Miss Uma. Pressed to the wet glass, my lips made a grin. He released the phone. I made a fist and thumped on the glass. He lowered the window with a look of displeasure. Sting's soft voice came through the window. What is it, Bowen? Sir, will you step out? There is a problem. What problem? His body just wouldn't budge. It knew. The body knew. Though the mind was too stupid to figure it out. The wheel, sir. I'll need your help. It's stuck in the mud. Then headlights flashed on me. A car was coming down the road. My heart skipped a beat. 
and it just drove right past it, splashing muddy water at my feet. He put a hand on the door and was about to step out, but some instinct of self-preservation still held him back. It's raining, Balram. Do you think we should call for help? He wriggled and moved away from the door. Oh no, sir, trust me, come out. He was still wriggling. His body was moving as far from me as it could. I'm losing him, I thought, and this forced me to do something I knew I would hate myself for even years later. I really didn't want to do this. I really didn't want him to think, even in the two or three minutes he had left to live, that I was that kind of driver, the one who resorts to blackmailing his master, but he had left me no option. It's been giving problems ever since that night we went to the hotel in Jangpura. He looked up from the mobile phone at once. The one with the big T sign on it. You remember it, don't you? Ever since that night, sir, nothing has been the same with this car. His lips parted, then closed. He's thinking, blackmail or an innocent reference to the past? Don't give him time to settle. Come out of the car, sir. Trust me. Putting the mobile on the seat, he obeyed me. The blue light of the mobile phone filled the inside of the dark car for a second, then went out. He opened the door farthest from me and got out near the road. I got down on my knees and hid behind the car. Come over this side, sir. The bad tyre is on this side. He came, picking his way through the mud. It's this one, sir, and be careful. There's a broken bottle lying on the ground. There was so much garbage by the roadside that it lay there looking perfectly natural. Here, let me throw it away. So at this moment, he's picking up this glass bottle. This is the tyre, sir. Please take a look. He got down on his knees. I rose up over him, holding the bottle held behind my back with a bent arm. Down below me, his head was just a black ball, and in the blackness I saw a thin white line of scalp between the neatly parted hair leading like a painted line on a highway to the spot of, on the crown of his skull, the spot from which a man's hair radiates out. The black ball moved, grimacing to protect his eyes against the drizzle, he looked up at me. It seems fine. I stood still like a schoolboy caught out by his teacher. I thought, that landlord's brain of his has figured it out. He's going to stand up and hit me in the face. But what is the use of winning a battle when you don't even know there's a war going on? Well, you know more about this car than I do, Balon. And, 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 what, and I don't really understand that sentence either. But... Uh, is the war the class war that, that Ashok doesn't understand? Um, I, I don't really understand that reference. That, that's worth more thought, and I haven't got an answer for it. Well, you know more about this car than I do, Balram. Let me take another look. And he peered again at the tyre. The black highway appeared before me once more with the white paint marks leading to the crown spot. There is a problem, sir. You should have got a replacement a long time ago and this has a double meaning here this replacement being you should have got a different driver mate because i'm about to slam your your head all right baron he touched the tire but i really think we i rammed the bottle down the glass ate his bone i rammed it three times into the crown of his skull smashing through to his brains it's a good strong bottle johnny walker black well worth its resale value the stunned body fell into the mud a hissing sound came out of its lips like wind escaping from a tyre. I fell to the ground. My hand was trembling. The bottle slipped out and I had to pick it up with my left hand. The thing with the hissing lips got up onto its hands and knees. It began crawling around in a circle as if looking for someone who was meant to protect it. Why didn't I gag him and leave him in the bushes stunned and unconscious where he wouldn't be able to do a thing for hours while I escaped? Good question and I've thought about it many a night. So here, this is that um, idea. I've, I've read a lot of student essays where they say Barham couldn't care less. Clearly, he, he does care, and it does, has bothered him over time uh, here. As I sit at my desk looking at the chandelier, the first possible reply is that he could always recover, break out of his gag and call the police, so I had to kill him. The second possible response is that his family was going to do such terrible things to my family. I was just getting my revenge in advance. I like the second reply better. So I think this is Balram's answer to why he's killed Ashok. He's killed Ashok because Ashok, if he ta just takes the bag, Ashok's family is going to kill all his family anyway, and he needs to get some revenge for that. Putting my foot on the back of the crawling thing, 
I flattened it to the ground. Down on my knees I went to be at the right height for what would come next. I turned the body around so it would face me. I stamped my knee on its chest. I undid the collar button and rubbed my hands over its clavicles to mark out the spot. It's very interesting. He's depersonalizing Ashok here, calling it a thing. But then what happens next is he likens it a little bit to his father as well. So it's kind of un unusual. The whole description to me just goes on for way too long with this, the murder. It's just I'm a bit over it. When I was a boy in Laxbanger and I used to play with my father's body, the junction of his neck and chest, the place where all the tendons and veins stick out in high relief, was my favourite spot. When I touched this spot, the pit of my father's neck, I controlled him. I could make him stop breathing with the pressure of a finger. The stork's son opened his eyes just as I pierced his neck and his lifeblood splurted into my eyes. I was blind. I was a free man. When I got the blood out of my eyes, it was all over for Mr Ashok. The blood was draining from the neck quite fast. I believe that is the way the Muslims kill their chickens. Remember, he thinks very highly of Muslims. But then tuberculosis is the worst way to go than this. So it's interesting that he comes back to his father um, at this and, and his father's death at this time, I assure you. After dragging the body into the bushes, I plunged my hands and face into the rainwater and muck. I picked up the bundle near my feet, the white cotton T-shirt, the one with lots of white space and just one word in English and changed into it. Reaching for the gilded box of tissues, I wiped my face and hands clean. I pulled out all the stickers of the goddess and threw them on Mr Ashok's body just in case they'd help his soul go to heaven. And then getting into the car, turning the ignition key, putting my foot on the accelerator, I took the Honda City, finest of cars, most faithful of accomplices on one final trip. Since there was no one else in the car, I left my left my left hand reached out to turn the sting off, then stopped and relaxed. From now on, I could play the music as long as I wanted. In the railway station, 33 minutes later, the coloured wheels in the fortune machines were coruscating. That's a, another word I've never seen before. I imagine that means going around. Let's have a look. Flashing, sparkling. There you go, flashing and sparkling. Coruscating. I stood in front of them, staring at the glowing and the whirling and wondering, should I go back to get Darren? If I left him there now, the police would certainly arrest him as an accomplice. They would throw him into jail with a bunch of wild men. And you know what happens to little boys when they get put into dens like that, sir. On the other hand, if I went back now all the way to Gurugayon, someone might discover the body. And then all this, I tightened my grip on the bag, would have been a waste I squatted on the floor of the station, pressed down by indecision. There was a squealing noise to my left. A plastic bucket was tumbling about, as if it were alive. Then a grinning black face popped out of the bucket. A little creature, a baby boy, a homeless man and woman, covered in filth, sat on either side of the bucket, gazing blankly into the distance. Between his fatigued parents, this little thing was having the time of his life, playing with the water and splashing it on passers-by. Don't do it, little boy, I said. He splashed more water, squealing with pleasure each time he hit me. I raised my hand. He ducked into his bucket and kept thrashing from the inside. I reached into my pocket, searched for a rupee coin, checked to make sure it wasn't a two-rupee coin, and rolled it towards the bucket. Then I sighed and got up and cursed myself and walked out of the station. Your lucky day, Darren which means he's going back for Durham. And there's something about the sight of this little boy in a bucket, so vulnerable, but with so much trust and playfulness. And he's really, he's touched by the innocence of this. And um, it reminds him of himself and the hopelessness of his life. It reminds him of Durham. And it brings out his uh, empathetic side. Uh, he's not a, a bad man. And um, he decides at his own risk to go back for Durham. And for all of you who are thinking of writing essays about what an awful person Durham is, remember that um, he, he has gone back at, and risked everything to save his, his nephew in this situation. So that I know that was very, very long, and um, hopefully I've got a couple of readers left with me. 
thank you if you've come all this way with me we've spent quite a lot of time together this is the second last video I haven't done the last one yet but hopefully by the time you're listening to this I have and it's there so like and subscribe to my channel and uh, stay in touch all right thanks a lot